Now, um, I'm going to talk to you about functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. <clears throat> Some of what I'm going to say to you, Stella has covered a little bit of, but we're going to run through it again because this is now the most common diagnosis that our group is seeing in reproductive age women and I believe we're only just scratching the surface of what's out there. So I think that this is one of the biggest diagnoses we're seeing and I want you to really start to understand it and think about it. So we're going to talk about what it is and what the names mean because there are a few names out there that people talk about. What you should be asking to make the diagnosis, what you should be looking for, why we worry about it, how to manage it, and then there's just a slide at the end to talk about men. So I think we'd all recognise this as probably a reasonably medically unhealthy phenotype. And we probably recognise this as a medically unhealthy phenotype as well. But I think there's an increasing number of women that sit in this bracket who also actually are a medically unhealthy phenotype. And it's this kind of bracket here that we're going to cover in the next wee while. So what are we talking about? We're talking about women and girls that present with primary and secondary amenorrhea with a functional cause. And that functional cause is a spectrum. It's between energy availability and stress. And there's no right or wrong mixture of that spectrum. It's different for everybody. This Pre presentation to a general gynaecology clinic by Mary Jane D'Souza suggests that incidence is about a third of women that present with secondary amenorrhea and a small number of girls that present with primary amenorrhea. I would suggest to you anecdotally in our clinics that this now constitutes about 50% of the referrals for secondary amenorrhea and probably about a quarter of the referrals for primary amenorrhea. So I think we're seeing a lot more than what this suggests. We tend to call this condition functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. It's an umbrella term and we quite like that term because it includes the girls who are stressed and with a lot going on as well as the athletes. But the Americans, and you will hear the sports physicians as well, tend to refer to one of these two statements, female athlete triad or relative energy deficiency in sport. <coughs> and female athlete triad is something that's been around for many years in the States. And then in about 2013 or 14, the Olympic Committee tried to rename it relative energy deficiency in sport. And there's lots of politics in the States around that, as you can imagine. Uh, but essentially, we're all talking about the same thing. This is a diagnosis of exclusion, so running through what Stella has just run through for you as a workup of amenorrhea is really important. Absolutely, there's some genetic predisposition. You talk to patients with mum in the room and mum will say, oh yeah, I had a stress fracture, I had a period of amenorrhea as well, really common. And there's other hormones involved as well. This is not just about oestrogen. Thyroid's involved, cortisol's involved, and IGF-1 is involved, and we're still working through exactly what they do. So, what your body does is develop an energy availability. So we take in all the calories that you give your body on a 24-hour basis, and we take out first all the calories we use. And I say to my patients, we take out all the calories we use for anything we make a conscious decision about. Walking to the bus, walking to school, all the training, PE at school, uh, walking to work. And then what is left over is our energy availability. And again, I say to patients that what is left over is everything that we don't make a conscious decision about. So running our immune system, running our brain, our gut function and our reproductive system is all dictated to by our energy availability. This is a version of the diagram that Stella has just shown you in a slightly different format, but it all sits round in the hypothalamus. And again, I say to my patients that the hypothalamus is a very old-fashioned area of the brain. 
And although we don't always think about periods nowadays as having babies, this is essentially making a decision at all times as to whether it's in our best survival interests to carry a pregnancy or not. And if we're in the middle of a war, or we're in the middle of a famine, it's not in our best survival interest to carry a pregnancy. And so GnRH is switched off, and we lose the pulsatility of the gonadotrophins, and we lose the ability to produce estrogen. And just as Stella suggested, the differential diagnosis is that the pituitary cannot respond to the change in estrogen levels. So you need to think about whether potentially there may be blockage in the pituitary and a pituitary adenoma. But comparatively, that's relatively rare compared to this diagnosis. So what are you looking for when you talk to these women? Well, what you're looking for is any change in exercise. I would highlight to you that the studies show that when an exercising woman is adequately fueled, she doesn't lose menstruation. So if you have this diagnosis, there is some form of energy deficit going on. So what's happened with exercise? What's happened with the schoolgirl athlete? We are seeing more and more of this. It's something else to be asking. The very talented schoolgirl athlete who perhaps is working in two or three sporting disciplines, has two or three different coaches. Nobody's talking to each other. The only person who really knows what's going on for that young woman is the, is the parent. And the parent doesn't really feel like they are they have enough information in the sporting code to be able to talk to the coach and suggest. But actually, that parent is the one who knows what's going on everywhere, and the coaches need to be talking to each other, and that young woman doesn't need to be doing all the training she's doing for every code. Those young girls also are completing growth, so our adolescent young women need more energy than our adult women. Looking for disordered eating trays is extremely common, and this is a spectrum. So down here we have the girls who have the frank eating disorders, where if you can't turn them around, they need to be handed over to eating disorder clinic. But most sit somewhere in the mid-range through to the athlete that is just not keeping up with the amount of calories required. But there's very often disordered eating trays on the way through, and understanding where your patient sits on that spectrum will be really helpful for managing. Management. And we don't really use fat mass, we don't have good uh, data to support it and we don't have good ways of measuring it, so we don't tend to use it. Okay, so why does it matter? I often again say to the young girls I'm seeing at this point, why are we all fussing about this because periods weren't that nice in the first place, so you're probably sitting there thinking, who cares? And the reason we care is normally very obvious to the woman in her early 30s who stopped her contraceptive pill wanting a pregnancy and not had a period. Uh, and she's often very motivated to reverse this. But the other reason that we care is estrogen is the most important bone forming thing that women have. And our young athletes are busy trying to reach peak bone mass and it's arguable whether they will ever reach their potential peak bone mass if they have had this condition at 17, 18, 16. So they've got an issue reaching peak bone mass, but women in their 20s and 30s are losing bone. Your athlete is not going to perform as well if she's not well nourished, and if she's not menstruating. So periods are performance enhancing. Our young athletes, and, or any athlete, is not going to recover as well from training sessions, is not going to be hitting their, perform their personal bests, going to be at higher risk of stress fracture, and higher risk of muscle and lig ligament injuries. So there's real reasons for these athletes to reverse this condition. As well as this, girls are not as well as they could be if they were better nourished. So it's very interesting when you start to ask some directed questions for these young women. Are they cold? Are they fatigued? And are anxiety levels high? And you often get nodding because they don't have the energy to keep warm. 
And it's becoming increasingly recognised that there is a gut condition that presents a bit like irritable bowel syndrome that will be part of this. And it's very, very common for young women to have seen nutritionists and gone through FODMAPs and exclusion diets before they get to us. And of course, that's just compounding the problem because it's still just pulling out calories. And often that gut syndrome will get better as periods start again. And changes in mental health is a really big one because that feeds into the top of the diagram I just showed you and then it feeds out the bottom. Anxiety levels will be higher. And if girls' brains are very undernourished, they just won't be as logical or cognitively crisp as they are as periods, as they are when they're having regular cycles and brains are better nourished. And often you will see as periods start again, suddenly that young woman starts to become a little bit more logical and might well say to you, I don't really know what I was thinking a year ago when I was in the midst of all of this. And finally, there's some very interesting work coming out looking at the coronary arteries and suggesting a premature atherosclerosis from this condition. So lots and lots of reasons to turn this around. And when you're having this discussion with this patient in front of you, it's very sensible to pick out the two or three things that are relevant to that young woman. So the athlete, of course, this is, this is what you're going to emphasize. But the academic girl who's very stressed, you're going to emphasize the issues around cognitive function. OK, so this patient is reasonably similar to what Stella has just shown you. So I'm going to move through this reasonably quickly. But she presents, this is also a very common presentation to our clinic. So she stopped her contraceptive pill a year ago, and she's been on the contraceptive pill since 17, regular cycles prior to starting the contraceptive pill. And she hadn't had a period since she stopped it a year ago, and she wants to be pregnant. And she comes to see you with her pelvic ultrasound scan, and she says, Doctor, I've got PCOS. Please give me some clomiphene. I want to be pregnant. And to give you a little bit more information, she's a lawyer and she's working 60 hours per week and she's finding it stressful and she copes with the stress by running. She did a stress fracture in 2016 and because she was worried about putting on a bit of weight, she thought clean eating would be a really good idea at that point and she lost about five kilos. And I don't really need to ask you what these blood tests show because you've just been heard about all of that. But I think the key here is that often in this condition, testosterone is actually reasonably low, and this is a mid-range testosterone. This is a very typical bone density that we see in this condition, this relative loss of spinal bone density compared to the hip. And just in case any of you weren't clear of the diagnosis, when you suggest to her that she should stop exercising and put on a little bit of weight, you get tears. So what are you going to ask women? And I would urge you to take your time here because this is where you're going to make your diagnosis. Typically, there's not much to find on examination. It's all on history. So I do a very quick screen. Stella is right, we do have excellent dietitians, and I would urge you all to get to know your dietitians and find out who has an interest in this area because it makes a huge difference. But I do a very quick screen for these girls. I t get them to tell me what they've eaten in the last 24 hours and how they've fueled around their training. I, get them to, I ask them if there's any food groups they avoid and also when they last had takeaways. And you can get a reasonably good idea, and what they had for their takeaways, reasonably good idea of what, how people are eating from that kind of screen. I get them to list out all their exercise, PE at school, walking to the bus, walking around university, because it's all about calorie drain and their injuries. You want to know about weight and you want to know about pattern of weight. So what's happened to weight over what's happened to periods over time? Women with lean PCOS will gain periods as they lose weight, but women with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea will lose periods as they lose weight. And that's quite useful to keep in mind when you're getting somebody to talk you through their menstrual history and talk you through their weight history. And what monarchal weight was and what, what weight 
girls were when they lost their period will also give you some information as to where they need to be to get periods back again. Psychological stress is a big thing. So my girls who are still at school, I get them to list out everything they do beyond their academic studies. So their leadership roles, their other interests. A young woman said to me last week, I can't remember what else I do because there's so much that I do, I've lost track of it all. And, and there's often a huge list. Okay, and then what are you going to look for? Well, clearly you're going to do waist circumference and body mass index. Uh, I would also stress to you that a BMI of 20 is not normal and does not exclude this diagnosis and you need to still think about it, especially in the athletes. You're going to do your gonadotrophins, look for any other causes of um, amenorrhea. A pelvic ultrasound scan, you could do a progesterone challenge if you can't get a pelvic ultrasound scan, so that's giving a young woman 10 days of Provera. And if she doesn't bleed, it suggests that li she is likely to not have much endometria. And I think about the endometrium <coughs> as the most estrogen sensitive tissue in the body. So if somebody hasn't had a period for six months and they don't have a very, very thick endometrium, if they've got quite a thin endometrium, that woman hasn't seen much estrogen for that six month time period. You could look at a bone density, I'm gonna talk about bones in a minute, and consider the place of whether you would do a pituitary MRI scan. And typically we don't scan all of these women. If pituitary function is otherwise normal, and if the clinical picture fits, and somebody is getting better in responding to the lifestyle changes, we wouldn't leap in and scan those women because of the incidentaloma rate. But if those things don't quite come together, absolutely we'd do a pituitary MRI. Okay, so this is a version of what Stella has just shown you. And the only thing I'm really going to say to you is that it's very possible that some women have a mixed picture. So it's very possible as ovaries turn on again when that GnRH starts to be produced, that that woman actually looks more polycystic with time. Cycles never come back particularly normally and testosterone levels are a little bit high and perhaps that woman develops some symptoms of acne and hirsutism. But we don't have great longitudinal data. In fact, in the literature, we've got zero longitudinal data for that group. So we don't really know the numbers of women that will develop that. But I tend to follow those women longer than I would follow a woman with just very straightforward hypothalamic amenorrhea. Now this comes from a paper uh, that is open access on the internet. It's a very good paper, very good reference for uh, patients. But the reason I've put this in is to show you this down here. So you can see that you move from beautifully four weekly menstrual cycles to nothing, but you don't do that in a week. You, you do that slowly on the way through and you have a lack of ovulation, irregular cycles, no periods, and you're going to do exactly the same as you go back again. So women will often tell you that they're starting to experience some cyclic symptoms, change in their vaginal discharge, and there may be some spotting, and then you will gradually move back again to develop a full weekly cycle. And of course, this is what we're aiming for. Okay, so how do you manage this? Well, I am now an expert negotiator because this is all about negotiation. And these are a very emotionally demanding group of women to treat. And I take anything the patient will give me. Okay, so what you're basically aiming for is you are aiming to address the energy balance Baseline, if you can get that young woman to eat 300 calories per day more, then you're doing really well, okay? Dietitians are invaluable here, but if you don't have access to a dietitian or you're not getting advice that kind of fits with where you want to head, that's what you want to aim for. Fueling around training is becoming increasingly recognised as important. So fueling before you train and in that kind of 15 to 30 minutes after you train, there must be some protein and some carbohydrate in that time, in that pre and post exercise um, fueling. 
The girls who get up first thing in the morning, don't fuel, and then go and do their training, often get into trouble because they haven't fueled for 10 hours or so, and then they're expecting their body to do what turns out to be quite a caloric, expensive exercise session. And this is often the big one because there are a large number of women out there using exercise for stress management and addressing that with women is really important. Hey, you're probably doing this to manage stress and anxiety. And so a little bit may well still be important for that young woman, but encouraging them to do other things to manage anxiety is also really important. Our, um, our elite athletes all have a rest day a week and I don't really understand why recreational athletes can't have a rest day a week, but the idea of that seems to be quite novel to a large number of women, and I encourage them all to at least have one rest day, convert as much exercise, high intensity exercise as I can into low intensity exercise, and try to, try to get rid of as much as possible. And I also tell them that this isn't a permanent change. We're only looking for this change for a period of time until they start to get better. And then with time we can start to get back into the training if that's what they want to do. So this is a multidisciplinary condition. The more that you can get a support team around that young woman, the faster you're going to get return. So all of these people have a really important part to play. We use dietitians and psychologists all the time. We're really keen on patients having good GP relationships uh, and every one of them is helpful. And of course, the girls who are getting sicker need eating disorder unit. And then you will often see them back at the other end because eating disorder unit will get the girls to a certain weight level, but almost always periods haven't come back at that point. And involving the patient support network for the athletes, involving the coach is really important. The coach is often the most important person in that young woman's life. And if you can't get coach buy-in to what's going on, it's close to impossible to actually bring about any change. But we are doing more and more education with coaches and I think there's more and more awareness out there that this is a problem that they need to address. And parents too are really important. Oops. And there's a very interesting study done by Sarah Berger out of Boston that looked at cognitive behavioural therapy for these women. She's very convinced that there is a personality type of woman that is affected by this condition. And they tend to be very goal-setting type A personalities. They tend to be perfectionists and they tend to be very good at putting other people's needs before their own. And I run through that with my patients and it's fascinating to see how many mothers sit there and go, yes, 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 that's my daughter, or how many women actually resonate with that. And this study looked at some cognitive behavioural therapy, 16 weeks in two groups of women that dealt with all sorts of things, setting boundaries, learning how to say no, body image, and three quarters of the group that went through the CBT got their period back compared to one out of about 20. They were small numbers in the control group and there weren't significant weight changes in either group. So psychology plays a big part of this and Stella and I have had patients who've left their husbands, left their jobs, started SSRIs and the condition is improves. So how to manage <coughs> there is more and more information out there for women and I think this is really, really important because most young women think that they are the only ones going through this. And I, so there's been two athletes that have come out in the media over the last few years and done a fantastic job. And if girls uh, Google them, they will find out lots of information of women who have been there and done that. Fuel Aotearoa is a website from a woman in Waikato who has set up a useful website. No Period Now What by Nicola Rinaldi is a fabulous book. It's a huge book, but it's a fabulous book of um, experiences of women who have been there. It's written for the lay public. She's also got an Instagram site that I can normally convince my young girls to get involved with, and the website is very good. 
Look for the mental health diagnosis, either on diagnosis or on the way through. Developing anxiety is incredibly common as we treat this and weight increases a little bit and addressing the anxiety with young women will help improve compliance. I do monthly blood tests, gonadotrophins and estradiol and I'm now up to about my sixth pregnancy that I've diagnosed with those monthly blood tests, two of which weren't wanted. So contraception, it is absolutely possible to ovulate before you have a period and telling women that is really important. So monthly blood tests you will often see you don't normally see FSH suppression at diagnosis. Girls have to be very eating disordered to have an FSH suppression. You normally will see what we've presented with an LH low or low normal and a low estradiol. If FSH is suppressed, you'll see that normalized first. Then you see LH improve, and then when you see estrogens of about three to 400, you'll see periods come back. It's important to tell girls this is going to take a long time. So it can take 6 to 12 months of normal stability before we see menstrual resumption. And that's why the blood tests are so important because these girls are making so many changes and trying really hard and without actually the blood tests you don't really know whether there's any progress being made at all. And a rule of thumb is if you can get that young woman two to three kilos ahead of where she was when periods stopped, you were heading in the right direction to get periods back. Don't always tell women that at the diagnosis because sometimes that means that they've got eight to 10 kilos of weight to gain and that can be really frightening for many women. But in your head, that's where you're heading and with time you can give that information. But some women need BMIs of 23 to 24 to menstruate. And that probably reflects the genetic component to all of this. So bones, what we know is that if somebody has been amenorrheic for six months or more, we will start to see changes in bone density. And clearly if somebody's been on a contraceptive pill, you don't know how long they've been amenorrheic for. But what we're looking for is the slightly lower spinal bone density than the hip because the bone that makes up the spine is more estrogen dependent than the hip. And we know that with continued hypothalamic amenorrhea, girls will lose about 2 to 3% of bone density per year. We know that that loss will turn around once we achieve weight regain. But girls won't start gaining bone again until they achieve ovulatory cycles. And whether they ever get back to what they would have lost or the, what they would have had if they'd had a four weekly cycle all the way through, we just don't know that with regards to what the data shows us. We haven't gone that far. The contraceptive pill is not helpful to protect bone density in this condition. Okay, I see that again and again. We'll start the pill to protect bones. It doesn't help. The data shows it doesn't help. And that's almost certainly because nutrition has a component to play in this. And also there are other hormones that are affected that are probably also affecting bone density. There is a little bit of data to suggest that transdermal estrogens might be helpful. And if my back's against a wall and we're really not making any changes and we've got significant bone loss, I will use some transdermal estrogen. But it takes away the ability to monitor blood tests and so you have to be aware of what you're doing when you do that. There is absolutely no data for using bisphosphonates or denosumab in this situation. The most, um, the most useful way to regain bone is to fix the condition, possibly a bit of transdermal estrogen. No safety data for the use of bisphosphonates in women who haven't had children yet and we shouldn't use it. Okay, so what about men? Well, this condition does exist in men. It's just that we don't know as much about it. But I would suggest that you could absolutely look out for it. It's really only been described in athlete men, not very stressed men, but I suspect it probably exists with high levels of stress as well. And it is a recognised cause of secondary hypogonadism. And it tends to present with changing sexual function or changing athletic performance. 
And it's often compounded by the fact that these men have been seen at men's clinics uh, and started on some testosterone without clear low testosterone levels and that certainly complicates the picture. But you do tend to see low or low normal testosterone levels with these men and low gonadotrophins. And the key is not to treat these men with supplemental testosterone, but actually in fact to educate them and treat their energy balance. So I would like you all to have a very high level of suspicion for this condition. I think we're all probably seeing much more of this than we actually recognise. And I would like you all to be educating women about this condition. Most women have no concept of energy balance and education is really important. Educating too that the combined contraceptive pill, you can't just say I've got a regular period on the combined contraceptive pill, I'm perfectly fine. And considering stopping the combined contraceptive pill for six months or so in our exercising women to make sure that periods are okay. Think about it in men and start to be educating the exercising men about this condition as well. Do not think that a BMI of 20 is normal. I hope we've all said that enough this morning that, um, because that's another common misconception. We see it with BMIs of 21, 22 quite commonly. Talk to the exercising woman about the issues around her training and talk to the academic girls around the issues around cognitive performance and use the strategies that are going to get buy-in from the patient. A multidisciplinary approach if you can at all do it and warning the patient at the beginning that this is going to take several months to treat and fix. And the most at risk time for recurrence of this condition is as periods return because everybody thinks, ah, we can relax now, we've solved this problem and then women go backwards. So watch for recurrence and continue to support this woman emotionally and physically to continue to get better.